From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The American economy keeps on growing despite rising interest rates with a 2.9% growth rate in last year's fourth quarter. No sign, at least not yet, of that much predicted recession. Plus, uh, does the fair tax, a 30% sales tax, on everything you buy have any chance of passing Congress. If you listen to Democrats, it's an imminent risk, but we're not so sure Republicans are going to make it through Congress with that. And Meta, the owner of Facebook, will let Donald Trump back on the social media site two years after he was banned. Will this help Trump or will it help Democrats more? Welcome to Potomac Watch. I'm Paul Gigo with the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal and here today with my esteemed colleagues, Kim Strassel and Mene Ukwe-Barua. Welcome to you both. Let's start with the economy. Solid top line growth, 2.9% in the fourth quarter, uh, adding up for the whole year now of 2022 of 2.1%, which was better than many had predicted, particularly after the first half showed no of the year, showed no growth at all. So that is good news. But if you look beneath the surface, there are some weaknesses in this report, and it isn't clear how sustainable this is, particularly when you look at the delayed impact of monetary policy, which started to tighten in earnest last March and often takes about a year to take effect. But, Manet, you looked at the numbers. What do you think? Well, I'd agree that it seems as if the worst is still yet to come, which is to say that most economists expect that the things that held up growth in the fourth quarter of 2022 are not going to be sustained. But that doesn't mean that we can't still feel fortunate that you do still have a certain amount of spending and investment continuing across the American economy. I think some sectors to watch are fixed investment. So particularly housing, even though prices haven't come down and we're still far from a crash, you see many fewer builders investing in building new plants, facilities, things like that. And so you might start to see the lag in growth at some point during the current year that comes out of that sector. But generally, it does seem as if the possibility of a soft lending for those who believe in it still exists. And what we've at least have by now is what I'd call a delayed landing. I think that the downturn has not come as quickly as most people predicted it would. So the economy is circling above LaGuardia and trying to come uh, find uh, Exactly. <laughs> and time, we, we should enjoy land. the smooth ride while it lasts. Uh, well, okay. I mean, yeah, if you look at the numbers, Kim, Manet's point about residential investment housing, you know, it really took a big chunk out of the fourth quarter. And fixed investment in general was uh, the rest of investment was flat or slightly down. And of course, that's investment is what sustains the economy over time. Consumer spending was okay, not terrific. But inventories in government contributed to uh, much of the growth, almost most of it. And those are not the strongest pillars on which to build a strong economy. Right. I think if you look at these, you see a couple of factors that provided, as it were, a boost to these numbers. So as you said, government spending inventories went up, that contributed uh, net exports. Also, some consumer interest in specific areas of the economy where there was pent-up demand, for instance, autos and auto parts, just because people couldn't get a hold of them for a while. Now they're coming back online. But you have to ask whether or not those are sustainable. They aren't, not in the long run. And if you look at the real numbers underneath, that's where there's still some cause for concern. So consumers are cutting back a little bit on discretionary spending. It was solid, but at the same time, retail sales fell at their sharpest pace of all of 2022. Existing home sales fell for the 11th straight month. Hiring eased, wage growth eased. If you look deeper into the consumer numbers, they cut back on uh, home electronic buying, furniture buying, clothing buying. They're no longer stocking up on goods. And this is a little bit of cause for concern because, as you know, Paul, these are the things that really do sustain an economy. Those numbers are looking a little bit more fragile. And we'll have to see how it goes. I agree with Manet. There's still the possibility here that things could end up in a soft landing. And I'd note that one reason is because certain outposts of the economy, certain states that have been doing a good job of their own deregulation are still meaning they're having better economic activity. So there are areas here where things are better and worse. But we'll just have to see where this lands in the end. In the silver lining department, if that's what you're looking for, the price level, price index for goods in the report 
They increased only 3.2% in the fourth quarter compared with 4.8% in the third quarter. So inflation does seem to be moderating, and that may probably will influence the Federal Reserve's calculations of just how high it needs to raise interest rates in 2023 to get inflation back to its 2% target. Next week, the Fed meets for its next Federal Open Market Committee meeting, and it's widely anticipated that it will raise rates again, but only a quarter point after a year of 75 and 50 basis point increases. So that will be something to watch, and we will see what impact that has on the psychology of financial markets. All right, let's turn to another economic policy question, the fair tax. This is the idea that uh, has been around for years, and uh, it is essentially about a 30% sales tax, national sales tax, which would trade that tax on everything you buy in theory, That would replace the income tax, the estate tax, and the payroll tax, the tax on what you earn in salaries. This is supported by Congressman Buddy Carter of Georgia, among others. And apparently Kevin McCarthy promised those people when he was in the throes of seeking votes for his speakership, he promised them a vote on the fair tax. And Democrats are elated by the prospect, almost having literally daily press conferences saying this is so extreme and so on. So there's a fair amount of backstage ferment on this right now. Let's listen to Buddy Carter explain why he supports the fair tax and then a brief clip on Kevin McCarthy saying whether he supports it still. The fair tax is nothing more than a simple consumption tax. This is a tax that would eliminate the the need for the IRS. It's a tax that would make sure that everybody's paying their fair share. And, and, you know, nobody likes to pay taxes, but people prefer a consumption tax over a property tax, over a a payroll tax, or over an income tax. This is a consumption tax. If you're going to buy a boat, you're going to pay the taxes on it. If you don't want to pay the taxes, don't buy the boat. Do you support the fair tax? The fair tax? Do you support the fair tax? There you heard it. A big no from Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House. Manet, what do you make of the prospects for this? Well, listening to Barty Carter explain the rationale behind the fair tax, I just wondered if you're going to propose a provision that has exactly no chance of passing, you might as well just say we're going to eliminate the IRS and income taxes without any sales tax to replace them. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, if, if he's thinking about how his pitch is going to sell to his constituents, he might as well have gone the full distance. But Basically, I mean, this is an idea that has been beloved by some sort of true blue economic conservatives since the 1990s. And Buddy Carter himself has previously introduced it before, but usually would have no chance of actually seeing the floor. It was only because he was able to extract this promise from Kevin McCarthy that it now seems as if it's entered the realm of possibility for something that might have a vote. And it does have a certain amount of economic merit behind it. This is something that some economists say consumption taxes are better for the economy than taxes on income. Why is that? Well, that's because we want to promote investment, basically work and investment are what grow the economy over time, as opposed to consumption, um, which is important to sustain economic activity, but that's not what's going to lay the foundation for future growth. And so on purely economic merits, the fair tax makes a certain amount of sense. But the fact is we have an income tax that isn't going anywhere, and it's extremely easy, as we've already heard, for Democrats to say Republicans are introducing a massive sales tax on everything you buy without discussing the reductions in the income taxes that would theoretically accompany it. Well, Buddy Carter, of course, would say, well, we're not going to pass this unless they repeal the income tax. But unless you repeal, Kim, the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which allowed an income tax, it's always the possibility is sitting there. Even if you passed a law in Congress that eliminated the tax, it could always come back unless you repeal that 16th Amendment. And That is as much as I would heartily endorse the repeal of the 16th Amendment. Probably not happening in my (laughs) lifetime, and maybe not even in yours, and maybe, maybe not even in Manet's. So what... uh... (laughs) 
<laughs> what we end up with, in my view, is some kind of national sales tax, which, of course, would be on top of state and local sales taxes. And that's how state and localities get a lot of their revenue. And you'd end up with some kind of income tax, too. So you'd end up with the worst of both worlds. But what's fascinating politically about this is I've seen this hurt Republicans time and time again. Even when Jim DeMint was running for Senate in South Carolina, he was a fair tax aficionado, and Democrats almost knocked him out by uh, hitting that 30% sales tax. Because the thing about voters is once they hear 30% sales tax, they don't really listen for the second sentence. (laughs) Exactly. No, I mean, this is an argument that is almost as old as me. (laughs) And by the way, thank you for that reminder of our relative (laughs) ages, Paul. Um, (laughs) No, you're entirely right. Look, Buddy Carter has a provision in here that says that his sales tax would go away in seven years if the 16th Amendment were not officially repealed. Well, as you said, good luck with that. And then what would end up happening is you'd have an income tax and you'd have this sales tax. And the other thing I would point out is that I think that there's some revenue problems with this as well, too, which also get to politics. Buddy Carter, if you listen to his feelings, you know, he says, we're going to be able to get rid of all these things, income taxes, payroll taxes, estate taxes, and we'll be able to get similar or better income with the sales tax instead. But the problem with that is that the other issue is that Washington, the politicians are constantly going to be making arguments for why there has to be exceptions to these sales taxes, right? So they're going to say, really, we're going to impose a sales tax on food? We can't impose it on food because that will really hurt low-income families. Uh, really, are we going to impose the sales tax on health care? I mean, you know, these are vital services that you have to get simply to, to live and succeed. So you're going to start seeing a political erosion, even if this were to get into place, of vast areas of taxation that would actually be drivers of money to Washington. So I'm not really sure it works from a practicality perspective either. I mean, you really have to close your eyes and cross your fingers and hope for all kinds of things to happen in Washington that seem absolutely impossible, meaning that you would repeal the 16th Amendment and that you'd also count on politicians to keep their backbone and continue taxing all of these things that were vastly unpopular with the American people. <music> 